Michael Swickard here. Welcome to Enchanting Stories of New Mexico, sponsored by the Fresh Chili Company in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Our award-winning Hatch Green and Red Chili is brought to you from locally owned farms in Hatch, New Mexico. That is the chili capital of the world. Hit subscribe to automatically get these podcasts Mondays and Fridays, this is a Friday edition, we have regular historical and cultural podcasts. On Wednesday, we focus on people. You know, people come from all over, and when they get to our little slice of paradise, they notice some of the names of towns and wonder about them. Usually it's just called place names because it's the place and it's just what we call it. But there's a story behind many of the names. An example is the town of Deming, New Mexico. We know where it is, but how did it get that name Deming? It settled in the 1880s when the railroad was built through the area and the town was formed. It used to be referred to as the town of windmills, had a lot of windmills, but not so much anymore with electric water pumps. It was named for the wife of one of the four men who built the early railroad. His name's Charles Crocker. That was his name. And he had the honor of naming the town, so he gave it his wife's maiden name. She was Mary Deming. Who, she grew up in Indiana. I don't know if they have a statue of Mary Deming in Deming, New Mexico. One of the four engineers commented, I understand. Deming, hmm, doesn't look a bit like her. Okay. One more. No gal, New Mexico. It wasn't a comment on the local dating social life Rather, it was Spanish for walnut tree, which there was a large one in the early 1880s in the settlement and more of them up the canyon. Originally, it was called Dry Gulch by the gold miners of the area, but that was changed after they had quite a flood. It is about 10 miles east of Carrizoza, New Mexico. In 1879, gold was discovered in the area, mostly around Baxter Mountain. It was discovered by John Baxter, that's where Baxter Mountain got its name, near White Oaks, the the old and the new White Oaks. It drew hundreds upon hundreds of gold miners looking for a find of their lifetime. Some did, some didn't. John Baxter discovered that, and over 30 years, more than $3 million worth of load gold. Now, load gold, L-O-D-E gold, and silver it was shipped, which that'd be about $110 million today. That's a lot of money compared to just doing agriculture. Speaking of building, they built an electric plant and a lot of mining equipment. Now, here's the thing, that it was load gold that got them there. It ran out after 30 years. The town also of White Oaks withered when the railroad went through Carrizoza, but not White Oaks. When the load gold was exhausted, and you can describe load gold, L-O-D-E gold, as holding a nugget in your hand, there was still some placer gold in the gravel and dirt. You process a ton of dirt with gold in it, and you make a few dollars, which provides a profit, but not much. That's still there, and they're still doing a little work, not much. In another podcast, I'll speak about the mining industry in New Mexico, small and large. Mining gold, silver, copper, lead, coal, uranium, zinc, manganese, iron, molly B, tungsten, calcium, tin, arsenic, and many other substances. Like in Lee County near Carlsbad, New Mexico, there is the world's purest potash, which is mined. And even for a time, the mining of bat guano for fertilizer, I don't think they're doing that anymore. This is Enchanting Stories of New Mexico, sponsored by the Fresh Chili Company in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Hit subscribe to automatically get these. We have some more, though. Did you know that the weather scientists have dubbed this an El Nino year? Our little part of paradise should have a warmer and wetter year. That is part of the El Nino-La Nina climate pattern, which was observed for a long time before being named as such, and then the data strongly suggested that the names were correct for what happened under each designation. The observed pattern is that a warm ocean current will flow along the equator off the coast of Ecuador around Christmas time. Christmas, okay, El Nino. Nino is a direct uh, reference to the birth of the Christ child, celebrated December 25th. That's where they get El Nino, coinciding with these climate patterns. 
The forecast of more rain causes ranchers to look hopefully at the sky. Farmers not so much since most of their water comes from the Rio Grande. You can tell people from New Mexico somewhere else because when somebody mentions in some meeting somewhere that it's raining outside, we always flock to the door or window to watch the rain. I love watching rain. I hope you do too. Good news on the lake waterfront. Elephant Butte Dam and Lake is at 28.2% full, up a tenth of a percent from last week. So it's still filling. A year ago, it was only 10% full. This is so much better for agriculture and recreation. Boating has really improved. Also, with the warm weather, fishing all over New Mexico has improved from the cooler months. With the warmer weather comes more insects for the fish to eat, and, and they all do a lot better. Good luck boating and fishing. Enjoy. Something most people don't know is that General Douglas MacArthur was once a resident of our area. It is true. Did he remember his time living here? Yes, he remembers it fondly. He said in an interview that he and his brother learned to ride and shoot even before they learned to read and write. Douglas was born in 1880 to Army Captain Arthur MacArthur, who was post commander of Fort Selden in 1884 for two years. That's when Douglas MacArthur was here. Fort Selden is 12 miles north of Las Cruces. Captain Arthur MacArthur received the Medal of Honor for Action in the Civil War, and his son, Douglas MacArthur, received the Medal of Honor for his World War II actions, making them the first father and son recipients. Both became generals. So when you drive by the ruins of Fort Selden, which there are still ruins there, it was decommissioned in 1891. Picture, if you will, the young five-year-old Douglas MacArthur riding and shooting and, I bet, smiling. A couple weeks ago, there was an interesting meeting at the Fabian Garcia Science Center, which is part of New Mexico State University's Agricultural Heritage and Future. At the facility just west of the main NMSU campus was a meeting to showcase the research being done on the growth and development of onions. Among the speakers was Dr. Christopher Kramer. He's a horticulture professor who has been at NMSU for more than 25 years and has been part of this onion research, which has released eight Numax varieties. When I say Numax, that's N-U-M-E-X, and that's what the Numax is a title of the variety. So there is a Numax Fabian Garcia. Now, he made this statement I thought was so good. Quoting here, onions are a very important crop in New Mexico. In 2022, 5,700 acres of onions were harvested in New Mexico. Those acres produced a total of 165,300 tons of onions. Those onions had a farm gate value of $153 million. In terms of farm gate value of agricultural crops grown in New Mexico, onions rank third behind alfalfa and pecans. So it was a great conference and great research from New Mexico State University. For two months a year, I have been told by other people about half of all the onions for sale in the United States are somehow tied to New Mexico. P.S. I love onions almost as much as I love chili. Together, onions and chili are great. Isn't that true? I believe it is. One morning at the cafe, a bunch of us were talking about New Mexico outlaws. The one that comes to mind for most people is Billy the Kid, but we didn't talk about him. Many outlaws made it through their wild years and then became somewhat model citizens or at least never reoffended with their outlaw ways. One such outlaw that I find interesting lived many years west of Oscura, New Mexico. That's 20 miles or so south and southwest of Carrizozo. His name was Baldy Russell. The name Russell was an assumed name. The name Baldy was an applied name for the lack of hair on top of his head. His real name was Jim Mitchell, and he was wanted in Texas at one time as a young man for murder in an 1870s Texas feud. In the wilds of the then territory of New Mexico in the 1890s, Baldy wasn't, wasn't uh, bothered by any lawmen. They didn't come there. The best we know, he never did run afoul of the law. 
There were many men in the Western history who were known as lefty or slim or baldy. These men had a history somewhere else, but it was considered an insult to ask questions of strangers. Hey, where are you from and who are you? So everyone left these guys alone. Baldy was noted for extreme quietness. Old timers tell of the time he rode into a Bar W cow camp at dinner time. Back then, at mealtime, everyone within riding distance was welcome to eat at any cow camp chuck wagon. Coffee, biscuits, and beans were always served, and cobbler, usually. Baldy rode into camp without speaking. He nodded to men he knew, but for reasons of his own, he didn't feel like talking. He got himself a plate of food and squatted down by himself. The cowboys knew that if Baldy wanted solitude, it was best to leave him alone. That is the way it was done in the territory of New Mexico 100, 120 years ago. Balding got himself a second cup of coffee, which he drank while rolling himself a Bull Durham cigarette. He handed the cup and plate back to the cook, and with a nod to the men sitting around there, which meant that anyone near his ranch at supper time was welcome to sh share dinner with him, he then ambled over to get his horse. On the way out of camp, he saw a horse he had once owned. He walked over to that horse, patted it, and to the horse spoke the only words he spoke. He said, Hi, fella. Now that's the real silent cowboy type. Another story about Baldy involves him and Jim Gilliland, a man who, while not officially an outlaw, was thought by some as having some of the same attributes as outlaws. At first, neighbors Jim Gilliland and Baldy Russell got along fine, but then one thing led to another, and they became suspicious of each other for stealing cattle. Each had mysteriously lost some cattle. This all built up to the point where one day Jim rode up on Baldy unexpectedly, and they both immediately drew their six-shooters and kept each other covered. Neither had made up his mind that shooting was called for, but both had pulled their pistols. They stared at each other for a little while. Finally, Baldy said, Well, one of us either ought to smile or we ought to pull the trigger. He meant that somebody either had to shoot or admit he was just fooling when he drew his pistol. Later, Gilliland said, I smiled because I knew Baldy didn't know how to smile. Baldy wasn't Billy the Kid, but I find him much more interesting. One thing that happens when people live in Las Cruces or live close or happen to be coming here to visit people, they can come by the Fresh Chili Company gift shop. It's located at 1160 El Paseo Road, Suite D7A in Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. No need for shipping when you come, and the neat thing is you can look at all the bottles and think about it and hold different ones next to other ones. Now, if you're living far enough away that you want to ship, if you buy 12 jars, we offer free shipping if you live in the lower 48 states. That excludes Alaska and Hawaii. Stock up and make sure you always have plenty of that, which when you open a jar makes everyone smile. That's Hatch Valley red and green chili. And a case of that delicious chili would make a great present for somebody who lived here moved away, and still has a taste for Hatch Valley green and red chili. Also, if you buy three jars, we'll donate one jar of our award-winning Mama's Salsa to a local food bank in New Mexico called Casa de Peregrinos. They provide school lunches and much, much more to people in need in our community. This is Michael Swickard with the Fresh Chili Company podcast, brought to you by the Fresh Chili Company. Thank you for your time today. We'll always have lots of news and stories about New Mexico for you on these podcasts. If you have something you would like me to talk about in a future podcast or somebody to talk about, you can write to michael at freshchilico.com. That's michael at freshchilico.com. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, yes, and eat plenty of that good Hatch Valley chili. Like I always say, some chili is good, more is better. Bye for now.